I will be very delighted to be joined by Dr. Ilan Pape, who is joining us um, via Zoom. He is, as I mentioned, is a very distinguished scholar who's been, whose work has been widely spread and translated in various languages. And I think one of his main um, key elements and researches it was about the whole Nakbi and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. His latest work also talking about the whole settler situation that turned the West Bank into one of the biggest prisons uh, in, in, in history. Uh, Dr. Ilan Pape, I hope that you can hear us. First of all, we wish you the best and hope you get well very soon and to beat COVID very soon. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Brilliant, thank you very much. I would, I would start with you to talk more about this work that you've been you know, working and engaging with Dr. Jenny Mansour lately and after this we will move to Dr. Johnny Mansour to give this a presentation on the whole origins of this in new vulnerable communities as part of the memory that you've been working on. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to, to apologize uh, for not uh, being with you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, although I'm recovering, I didn't want to uh, pass the, the virus. I think you have enough problems as it is in Bethlehem. Uh, it really saddens me with so many friends I wanted to reunite with, former students, future students, and so on. But thank you very much for making the efforts uh, of having me online. Let me get straight to the topic as both Dr. Mansour and I have only 20 minutes together to present our, our project. Um, I will describe the project in general in one or two sentences and talk about the first part of the project. Dr. Mansour will talk about the second part of the project. Uh, the project in, in general is an attempt to understand the way Palestinian communities receive, treated, absorbed, catered for Palestinian refugees within historical Palestine in the first few years uh, after the Nakba. Uh, the idea for the project started actually quite incidentally when we came across uh, uh, boxes in the uh, old library in Nablus that were not touched upon for more than 70 years. And when we looked into them, we found that these were records of a municipal committee founded by the mayor uh, of uh, Nablus in 1948, uh, uh, records of a special committee that was asked to cater and look after the many refugees that arrived in uh, uh, Palestine, in, in Nablus, and also in Janine and Tulkarem, uh, uh, in the wake of the Israeli operations of ethnic cleansing uh, all over uh, Palestine. And we were surprised to see that uh, the many boxes contained a very pedantic, systematic work of a municipality, in fact three municipalities, in looking after hundreds of thousands of refugees. Uh, uh, and we found out that this is a chapter that con connects to the history of the Nakba, but is usually overlooked uh, by historians of uh, the Nakba. And there were a few uh, aims or objectives of our research once we delved into these uh, very rich uh, documents. Uh, the first was, uh, uh, we, we found out that actually most historians, including Palestinian historians, uh, tend to say that for 48, you only have Israeli archives. In fact, you have the colonialist archives, and if you want to uh, write the history of the Nakba, you really need the Israeli uh, documentation, as we did when we were called uh, the new historians back in the 1990s. So first of all, we indicated that there are Palestinian archives, and they are a very important source for understanding what happened not only during the dispossession, the destruction, but also what happened to the people after they were dispossessed and dislocated and uprooted by force uh, of the Israeli ethnic cleansing operation. 
The second objective that we wanted to show is the level of solidarity, the compassion that was shown by Palestinian communities to Palestinian refugees. In fact, we believe that that kind of solidarity, that kind of sacrifice by the hosting communities in historical Palestine, in the first part of our project, in the towns of Nablus, uh, uh, Tulkalem, and Jenin, that kind of solidarity uh, enabled some, a large number of Palestinians to remain within historical Palestine. In other words, without that solidarity, there and also in other parts, and Johnny will talk about the Galilee, the number of Palestinian refugees outside of historical Palestine would have been much larger, probably double, uh, had not these solidarity uh, activity taken place. The third one, uh, uh, the third objective was to show that this solidarity was not incidental. It was uh, the nature of the Palestinian society before the Nakba. The uh, solidarity between communities, we found out, and Johnny will talk about it, that in the Galilee, the Druze communities played a very important role in saving Palestinians from being becoming uh, refugees. The solidarity between sects, people of different religions, of different uh, backgrounds, was the tapestry, the mosaic of live and let live of pre-1948 Palestine. And we say that it played a very important role in, this, uh, in salvaging uh, the, uh, the, the refugees uh, when they arrived in other Palestinian uh, communities. Um, and the last uh, uh, objective was to look towards the future. We felt that there is a model here uh, that uh, can help and advise those who are engaging, especially in Europe, with the uh, uh, many refugees coming from the Arab world since the uh, uh, civil war in Syria in 2012 and in other places uh, in the Arab world. So let me just very briefly uh, say uh, something about the first part of our project that looks at the activity uh, of the uh, municipalities of uh, uh, Nablus, Jenin, and Tukaran towards the refugees. The first point to mention is that all three towns received, three, uh, three refu uh, received refugees thrice the number of their inhabitants. Three times more than their original number. So uh, a, a, a small town of 20,000 had to deal with 60,000 refugees, for instance. Uh, this is incredible if you think about it. Secondly, the towns and the people who received these refugees had very meager resources themselves. Uh, and yet they were able to cater for the most basic needs for these uh, refugees. Another point which is very important, this was done at the time of political chaos. There was no real government in, the, in place in those three towns in the first years after the Nakba, at least until 1950. International aid came only in 1950. And uh, it was, in some cases, the war raged on also after the refugees had arrived in Nablus, Jenin, and Entul Karim. Despite all these hard uh, circumstances, uh, the, the records show very systematic a very humane treatment of women, children, families, catering for their uh, abodes, their education, their food, uh, and their welfare, even to the level of uh, uh, affording processes of marriages and, and, and divorce and, and, and burial, uh, if need be, in those uh, uh, two, two, two years. Um, and, and, and this uh, uh, is really a chapter of resilience, probably today we call it sumud, but it's more than that. I think it's resilient and it's also a chapter of resistance. Maybe not the resistance by force, but the resistance by spirit. And uh, something that uh, the younger generation should be aware of, uh, uh, that the Palestinians were not just victims in the, in the Nakba. They also had agency. And each individual story, and this comes even more in the story of the Galilee, uh, each Palestinian that lost everything was able to build their lives uh, uh, from nothing 
uh, and, and re reassert the place uh, 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 in the world. Finally, before I, 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 I move to, to Johnny, the records are so detailed that it also tells you, as many of you know, I'm sure, the kind of human capital that these refugees possessed, a capital that had it been invested in a future Palestine, and not in a destroyed Palestine, would have turned Palestine one of the best countries uh, in the Middle East and the Arab world. As we know, this human capital was later invested in Arab countries, in economy, education, culture, and so on. But I think it's very important to look at the Nakba, as I said, not just as a moment of destruction, of victimhood, but also a moment of resilience, of agency, and of infrastructure of human courage, uh, compassion, and solidarity that enabled us to understand how the Palestinians did not disappear and continue the struggle to this very day. Thank you. Dr. Johnny Mansour, the floor is yours now, if you may. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ilan. Um, in the second part of, um, uh, of this uh, very short and small lecture about our project, just to mention that the first part will be published in a book uh, with another two volumes of documents. I hope that this will be in the coming year, 2024. But uh, as Ilan Pape mentioned uh, before, the, the research is, uh, uh, is, is focusing on the resilience of the Palestinians in, in so many parts of Palestine that divided in, in 1948. But uh, we decided that after we finished the first one, and it took eight years to complete the first part, I hope that the second part will be completed in a few years. But uh, who knows, this is history, and some of the historians uh, who are present here knows how uh, research in history is going. But anyway, in this part of, uh, of our project, that is focusing on Galilee and the north part of the coast. That's mean between uh, Haifa and uh, uh, Jaffa. Uh, Israel demolished in the district of Haifa 64 villages, and just two villages remain there. So, a part, let us say, 80% of our project in, uh, in Galilee and 20% on the coast. So uh, we were lucky to find the older generation of both uh, the host and the refugees who still recollected the encounter as well as a second generation that heard the stories from their parents and even third generations learning about it from their grandparents. And that's mean, uh, since two years, we, uh, me and Ilan Pape, we uh, visited more than 30 uh, uh, destroyed villages and exist villages in Galilee. And we met people from the first generation and the second and even the third generation. And we hear the same stories about Nakba and about resilience and so on. That's in the Sumut. There is difference between the Sumut of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and, and East Jerusalem and those who are in the refugee camps in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, etc. But Palestinians, uh, they, still Palestinians anywhere in the world. So uh, we, we found that so many details that they are still in their memories since 1948 till now, that means 75 years, they are still remembering the whole events that happened in their villages. And this is very important to give the whole uh, uh, 
picture about the, uh, uh, the situation that happened at that time and those who became refugees in their homeland. I mean, they became, you know, they became citizens of Israel. At the same time, uh, the Israeli government didn't give them any permission to return back to their villages, even that if the village is only one kilometer in distance from where they became refugees. Just to give you an example that we visited Safuri village uh, uh, near Nazareth, is only one kilometer the distance between this village and uh, Nazareth that located in the same area, they, they only can see their destroyed homes and the new settlement that the Israeli government established on their lands. So, uh, but uh, uh, the most uh, uh, thing that we find in our uh, interviews and in our uh, uh, visits to these villages and the people of these villages who remained basically, as I mentioned before, in Galilee and in the, in the uh, coast of, uh, of Haifa, uh, what was the level of compassion and solidarity as it's the same that we found in the area of Nablus, Jenin, and Turkarim in our first uh, part of uh, this research. The most illuminating example of this legacy that we are going to mention it was the hospitality shown by the Druze communities in Galilee. It is not a secret that today, after 75 years of close collaboration between the Druze community in Israel and the State of Israel, there are high tensions between this group, I mean the Druze, and the rest of the Palestinians inside Palestine 48. But, however, in 48 and even in 49, the Druze villages in Galilee provided shelter for the refugees, most of which were Muslims, but with a sizable number of Christians. A good example that we uh, uh, searched very deeply was the solidarity and the care in the village of Yarka. I hope that I show it on... Uh, Last L of Al Jair in Arabic. You can see it there. Okay. Um, uh, now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, for, for more than six months, in the second part and second half of the year 1948, this village, Yarka, with only 2,000 people catered for more than 52,000 refugees. It was a poor village. Now it is a rich village. It was a poor village and yet shared with them the little food, water and housing. Israeli attempts to expel the villages was met by the Mukhtar, that means the, the mayor. By, uh, by the Mukhtar of Yarka, warning that he would leave with his community with the refugees. Such villages, like many others, had to take the children to its schools and, where possible, provide jobs and places to live. Even we found that monasteries, churches, schools, mosques, community centers, turned into a hole divided by blankets to create rooms for the refugees and food constantly was collected and distributed. There was an international aid. That's me. There was not an international aid. No UNRWA, because these were allegedly citizens and not refugees. The Palestinians who 
uh, uh, who, who stayed in Israel, okay, they became citizens of Israel, but they are refugees, what we call it internal refugees, in other villages. So no Israeli help to life dependent on the host as well as chances to remain in the homeland. This was more than just solidarity. This was unique, as we mentioned before. This was uh, a, a compassion, a solidarity, and even uh, 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 helping these these people uh, that uh, that became that became refugees in rebuilding their life, even from zero or even less, because they lost their houses their lands, their properties, and also they lost their dreams. So to, to conclude in four uh, uh, points, uh, it became clear to us that the Palestinians own an archive. This is what we want to mention. That according to the first part of our research, we use more than 90, 95% of the documents from the uh, public uh, library in Nablus. And it was amazing that we find, by, by <laughs> accident, more than 8,000 documents in boxes that they are still exist since, since 48. That means these boxes waited for us. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, uh, to confirm that we have, the Palestinians, we have our archives. But sometimes we need uh, some files and uh, documents from the Israeli archives. Most of the Palestinian documents that uh, uh, people uh, uh, forget or didn't succeed to take on with them in 48, they became a part of the Israeli archive. That means this is a part of the big robbery of Palestine. The second thing that we, uh, we are going to mention, and this is what we examined in the first part, is the Palestinian resilience, the sumut. This is, does not mean that the Palestinian is in a state of victim all the time. But rather that the Palestinian is working personally and collectively to rebuild again after losing almost everything in 1948 and after. The third point that Palestinian society in its internal structure is a supportive society and it has the foundations of reception, absorption, and compassion in times of crisis. This is what we examined in the first part of uh, the research in the area of Nablus, Jenin, and Tulkarim. And this is to mention that uh, Palestinians who uh, became refugees in these three uh, cities and the uh, villages beyond uh, we are talking about around uh, 100 villages in the districts of Haifa and Jaffa. Because most of the refugees who came to these cities and around villages, I mean in the area of Jenin, in the area of Nablus, in the area of Tukarim, most of them, they are from Haifa and the villages of Haifa and from Jaffa and the villages around Jaffa. The last point that we are going to mention in this part, the second part of our uh, uh, research, that our experience with the concept of observing refugees in 1948 is a lesson, yes, I'm going to show me that. <laughs> is a lesson for understanding uh, how Arab and even African refugees should be observed in Europe. This is a major challenge for European societies. And in the first part, and uh, uh, my colleague 
Ilan Papé just mentioning this uh, uh, point, that also we compare the uh, observation, observation, observation of the Palestinians in Nablus, Turkarim, and Jenin with the observation of the uh, and the solidarity of the uh, German communities in some of the southern villages and cities uh, in Germany uh, after uh, 2015. So this is, uh, I think, this is a new approach of research that will open an, uh, uh, a, a, a new uh, path of thinking how to compare uh, uh, such events and crises in history, even that we are comparing between what is uh, happening now with what happened to the Palestinian people. Thank you. Thank you.